And uh, we're going to come back today to the, to the message simply called Flourish. Flourish. And the, today's title is a quote from a very thirsty man. His name is Moses. And the title of the quote that he offers us is this. Please, show me your glory. Please, sh show me your glory. Um, let's read together John chapter 7. This is sort of the platform for all the messages recently. It's um, in the middle of a feast. It says, then on the most important day of the feast, the last day, Jesus stood and he shouted out to the crowds, all you thirsty ones, all you thirsty ones, come to me. Come to me and drink. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scripture says. Jesus was prophesying about the Holy Spirit that believers were being prepared to receive. And, and now we'll go to Exodus. Exodus. Oh, but the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out upon them because Jesus had not yet been unveiled in his full splendor. That's, a, that's an important phrase. His, so Exodus chapter 33. Pay close attention to the details here. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you've said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, God said, God said to Moses, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, don't make us move. <laughs> don't bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight unless you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing that you've spoken for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And Moses said, why don't you say what Moses said? Please, show me your glory. One more time. Please, show me your glory. This is God's word. You may be seated. So the, the main idea in John chapter 7 is a message that Jesus offers. He says, if you come to me, <laughs> I'm going to satisfy a really deep thirst in your soul. And not only that, I'm going to change what comes out of you. It's going to be a new one. It's going to be different. And so John chapter 7 is about really two movements. Something comes into us, eternal life. Something comes out of us, the Holy Spirit. And... Um, and the context for this message, interestingly to me, is a feast. It's a feast. And, and today I want to call this feast a testimony because the feast was designed to focus the children of Israel in a particular way to worship God. They were, they were to rehearse God's faithfulness to their nation back in the day that Moses was their leader. Um, we're kind of coerced to remember Moses if you're, if you're at, the, at the feast. And, you know, remembering Moses is important because, well, I'll show, I'll show you why. They remembered his miracle birth. You may, if you know the Moses story, you know that all the Hebrew boys were being killed because there were too many under Egyptian, the Egyptian uh, slavery. The, 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 the Hebrews just kept growing. So they had a genocide against the babies. But Moses' mom put Moses in a basket, put him in a river, and as he was floating down the river, uh, Pharaoh's daughter found baby Moses, took him to the palace. It's so interesting because 
Moses' sister had been tracking the basket, and when Pharaoh's daughter found Moses, Pharaoh, uh, Moses' sister said, hey, if you need a nanny, I know somebody. And she went to Moses' original mother, the birth mother, and, and they all lived together in the palace together. Isn't that an amazing story? A miracle birth. They remembered that at, at the festival. Not only did they remember the miracle birth, they remembered the rescue story of Moses because, oh, when Moses, I guess he was a teenager or a young adult, I don't know, but he, got, he became grieved at the way the Egyptian taskmasters were treating the Hebrew slaves. And one day he killed, he killed an Egyptian. And he had to run for his life as a fugitive. And he's living in the wilderness. But one day in the wilderness, there's a burning bush. Do you guys know this part of the story? A fire on the bush. And the bush began to talk to Moses and said, Moses, I know it looks bad for you, but I have a plan for your life. <laughs> now I want you to go to your grandpa, Pharaoh. Go to your grandpa, Pharaoh, and tell him to let my people go. And, and he did. And, you know, that was Moses' personal rescue story. But they remembered not only the miracle birth and the rescue story, the, the festival was designed to remember the forging of their faith as a nation. Because you may remember the part about the Red Sea where the armies of Pharaoh are chasing Israel and the, the, the former slaves. They come right up to the Red Sea and, oh, no, what's going to happen? And God said, just stand still and watch what I'm about to do for you because I love you so much. And they and God blew, according to the scripture, he breathed on the Red Sea and it opened up and they crossed on dry ground. And yet on the other side of the Red Sea, they failed to enter into the promised land because when they scouted the land, they saw giants and they went, oh, the giants are so much bigger than God. And so they wandered in the wilderness for, for 40 years. Moses himself died in the wilderness because he pastored people who lacked faith. I mean, you know, some people get stuck with bad pastors. And some pastors get stuck with bad people. <laughs> but some pastors and some people find their sweet spot, and the name of that church is Trinity Church. So, anyway, just seeing if you're listening. Um, so the festival, the festival remembered it remembered the miracle birth and the rescue story and the forging of their faith. And especially the festival remembered the wilderness grace. Because even though God's people had failed in their faith, they survived the wilderness. You're going to survive the wilderness. They survived the, the wilderness. And, and, and so this feast was all about how God was faithful to them in the wilderness. So the, the, the feast involved tents because God had provided shelter for them while they were in the wilderness. And the feasts, there were feasts about manna because every morning when they woke up, there was bread on the ground supernaturally. And, and the feast was about Passover because the nation of Israel knew that as they were leaving Egyptian bondage, not one of them died because they had put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost to protect them. And, and so the feast was, this particular feast was about water because when they were in the wilderness, they grew so thirsty. They didn't think they were going to be able to make it, but they found a rock and the rock produced the water, and all of this is being celebrated in the, in the feast. So imagine. Imagine all of Israel's reaction when Jesus on the last day of the feast stood up and he said, guys, I am your wilderness grace. <laughs> all of the celebrations about Moses, don't you know his story was about me? I am the shelter for you in the wilderness. I am the bread that showed up every morning for you. I am the water that gushed out. I'm the rock from which the water gushed. You know, and the idea is if there's anyone in the wilderness now, because they were in the wilderness, say like Roman oppression and religious oppression. They were in the wilderness. And so he's standing up saying, the way God was faithful to Moses back then, I, I was part of that story. I'll be part of your story. I'll get you through the wilderness. Just come to me and out of your innermost being. And so that's what, that's what was happening at the feast. So Jesus, the point I'm trying to make is that Jesus really is tagging on to the Moses story. Okay. He's really tagging on to it. 
And, and the message, today's message for us and, and then as well, is about grace and glory. Grace. You, you, you may have noticed we read the text. It was, what, four times, three times. You know, Moses said, if I found grace, if I found grace, and, and, and it's a great word. It's a Bible word. It, it speaks of capacity, our capacity to live it's, the idea is even though we don't deserve a shelter, he gives us one. Even though we don't deserve bread in the morning, he gives it to Even though we, we don't deserve water, he makes sure that we're not going to die of thirst. He give, This is grace. He gives to us whatever we need for the occasion that we're facing. If you need strength, he gives you the grace. If you need, you know, patience, if you need endurance, if you need guidance, that's all under the banner of his grace. That's why Paul can give a testimony and say, yeah, I'm hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. Yeah, I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. Yeah, I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I'm struck down, but I'm never going to be destroyed because there's a capacity inside me that is beyond me. What should have happened to me did not happen to me because God is with me. That's grace. See, that's grace. We have a lot of trophies of grace in our house, a lot of great stories of God's grace. But Moses shows us a very unique way that grace leads to glory. Um, look, look at Exodus 33 with me because it's so intriguing to me. I, it's really ministered to me th this week. The first thing about grace is that it brought Moses into a friendship with God. It brought Moses into a friendship with God. Verse 12 of Exodus 33 says, you said... I know you by name. Moses is talking to God. You said I know you by name and that I have found grace in your sight. Verse 11 says, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And so the first thing we know about grace is that it brought to Moses a very special relationship, a unique access to God. Oh, God delights in Moses, his friend. I mean, if you could eavesdrop on conversations, it would, you could hear God say, oh, Moses, I enjoy being with you so much. Oh, Moses, you're my man. You're, Moses, you're just, you, you, I, everything about you is desirable to, to me, Moses. You know, he's just talking about Moses. He, he, he says, Moses, I'm going to let you participate with me in everything that, that I'm going to do. Through. And the point that I really want to make is Moses knew he was God's friend. He wasn't walking around on eggshells all the time wondering if God was going to smack him down. No, I am the friend of God. That was, Moses wrote that song. See, so, so on. Now, I just, I just need to remind you that anything that happens in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, cannot be superior to what is available in the New Testament. Cannot be. It cannot be superior to what is available in the new covenant. And I don't know if there's anybody in the 11 o'clock service who could have that testimony of God's grace and go, okay, I'm the friend of God. I know I'm the friend. I have an awareness. God's not going to smack me. He likes me. He delights in me. Because that's the first thing that grace does is it makes us acceptable to the Lord. Somebody say amen if you have found that grace. But the second thing that grace does for Moses is it established his testimonies. Established his testimonies. In other words, they grew this relational history together, Moses and, and, and God. That's why old people love to tell the same stories over and over again. How many times have you heard the pots and pans story from Beck? You know, how many times have you heard us tell about the 10-pound bag of potatoes that kept us alive for years and years and years? No, it was a, I think it was a few days. But, but uh, we just tell the same stories over and, and over again. And, and it does something. It, the testimonies activate spiritual movements. And testimonies do, do something to our hearts. So God and Moses, they're, just, they're friends. They're telling their stories back and forth to, to one another. I can just imagine. And God go, or Moses go, oh God, don't you remember when we crossed the Red Sea? I mean, I mean, those enemies, they thought they had us. And I, you told me just to touch the rod down into the water and you breathed. And oh God. And, and what about the face on Pharaoh? Whenever I threw that rod down and it turned into a snake, you would have thought Pharaoh was going to freak. And God, you did so good with the frogs. How did you think of frogs? God. I love that you did the frogs and, and, and God, oh, I remember when you invited me up to the top of the mountain and you gave us the commandments and the, you know, the tablets and I carried them down. Oh, my face was 
so bright. I had to cover it because everybody's like, we don't have sunglasses back in that moment. So it was just, it was just amazing. And on and on and on. They're just telling stories back and forth because testimonies activate and grow the, the grace. And again, I don't know who's in the 11 o'clock service today, but can anybody just wave at me and say, I can sing great is thy faithfulness. I can talk about amazing grace. I can say God's been good to me. I got some stories. I got some history with God. So Moses had this friendship with God and he had all these testimonies. And yet, he had strife in his heart. He had strife in his heart. Now, again, I just want to remind you, in the Old Testament, it shows us glimpses and hints of the New Testament glory. And in the New Testament, there's a, there's a glory that unfurls the splendor of the Old Testament stories. It gives them depth and, and, and meaning. And so pay attention to Exodus chapter 33 because there's so many details in here. For instance, in verse 7, did you know Moses had a special tent to live in? Oh, he's not going to have roommates. No, sir. He lives in a special tent. It's called the tent of meeting. And when Moses starts walking out of the village to his tent of meeting, all the people come out. It's like the OK Corral. They come out. They start looking through the windows. They sit on the porch because, oh, no, Moses is going to the tent of meeting. And when he got to the tent of meeting, is he going to go in? Yeah, he went in. And he went into the tent of meeting. And as soon as Moses went into the tent of meeting the cloud I'm not talking about the cloud that you not that thing that saves all your bills and data and personal information I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the cloud of God's presence his glory came into the tent with Moses Moses is inside the tent with the cloud of God's glory and, and the people, they didn't get to go in the tent. Only Moses got to go in the tent. If the people needed something from God, they had to go to Moses. Moses would come out of the tent. And out of Moses' innermost being would flow whatever the rest of the people needed. Moses had a tent. But he's still not satisfied. He's still not happy with his walk with God. There's an episode in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. They became Jealous over Moses' relationship with God. There was Aaron and Miriam. They were sort of the, they were the ringleaders of a little bit of a rebellion that was going on. And God kind of called them on the carpet. He said, I got a word to say to you because Moses is my friend. And I'm just going to read the Bible to you. It says, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. In other words, that's why Daniel, you read the prophecies of Daniel, he's got a lot of numbers. You got to calculate to figure out what Daniel is trying to get across. Or, you know, Ezekiel, he's got a wheel within a wheel. Nobody understands what that means. And yet Ezekiel saw it because God is speaking to him in a dream, in a, in a vision. But I'm reading the Bible again. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Moses gets face to face. That's not... That's not literal. That's what theologians call an anthropomorphism. It's, it's when you give God a human characteristic just to help you understand a little bit, to know something that is really ra rather unknowable or to understand what seems to be under, you can't understand it. So we just kind of give him attributes. But here's the idea of the communication. It's like Moses and God were mouth to mouth. They were whispering to one another. They were talking plain to one another. And so much grace. So much grace for Moses. Oh my goodness. He had a friendship with God. He had testimonies with God. He had his own special tent where the cloud came in. He had plain talk face to face with God. And yet, Moses wanted more. And it leads us to this amazing conversation. 
Beginning in verse 12 of Exodus 33, Moses starts the dialogue. Moses starts the dialogue. You asked me to bring your people up, but you haven't let me know yet who's going to go with me. I, I realize that you gave me grace and that you know me by my name, but if I found grace, show me your way that I may know you and find more grace in your sight. That I may know you? Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? Moses knows God better than anybody on the planet. If anybody knows God, it's going to be Moses. And yet Moses is saying, I just want to know you. I'm just, I know you know my name and I know that you've given me grace and I've got the testimonies and the tent. But I want to know you. And God responds and says, Moses, my presence is going to go with you. And Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, I just can't go. And that's because Moses understands. He knows that what has happened to this point had nothing to do with him. It was all God. Moses is, is like, yeah, yeah, I know that I had the rod and I did the praying and I handled the tablets of stone, but God, this is all you. I know how we defeated our enemies. I know how that bread showed up every morning. I know how the water came out of the rock. I know that you have done this for us, and so I'm not going unless you're going. We got to go together. <laughs> and God said in verse 17, again, for the second time, Moses, I'm going with you. You have found grace. I know you by name. And Moses, this is the most audacious. This is jumping off the bridge. How dare he? Moses says, God, show me your glory. I mean, I know that God knows everything and he's not caught off guard by this. He probably anticipated this. But it seems like God is like, what? You want to see my glory? And, and then God says, well, I'd like to show you my glory, but there are side effects. And if I show you my glory, you're, you're, not, you're not engineered for that. So here's what I'll do. I'll, because you want to see my glory, I'll hide you in the cleft of a rock. I'll put my hand over you. That's another anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. And I'll cause my goodness to pass by you. And when I get by you, I'll move my hand, and you can see, you can see my hind parts. That's what the Bible says. I mean, any part of God is beautiful, right? <laughs> you can see my hind parts. You can see that part of my glory. You can see that part of my glory. And... Um, and I'll show you what I can show you, but it has to be in moderation. I'll show you what I can show you, but it has to be in moderation because, Moses, there's so much more to me than you're even imagining. And so that's what God did. He put Moses in a rock so that there could be a fresh revelation of the glory of God. And Hebrews explains to us, of course, that the rock that was in the wilderness was Jesus. And I just... Somebody needs to testify right now. Say, Jesus is my rock. Come on, say it. Jesus is my rock. So when we're hidden in the rock, we have, we have the caliber we need to see the glory. So it's a message about grace and glory. Glory, that's a word that the Bible uses to talk about the weight of God, the heaviness of God. It's when God displays his attributes on the earth to the humans. But it's always in moderation. 
It's always in moderation because the molecules in our body are not engineered or structured to handle the radioactive nature of his glory. We just melt. I mean, I don't know how many, if you remember the Indiana Jones movie, what's the name of that movie? Uh, Temple of Doom, where, you know, they take the lid off the Ark of the Covenant and their flesh just, you know, the glory of God comes. That is a theologically accurate movie because their flesh just, uh, just turns into skeletal type stuff. That's... And so God says, I don't want that to happen to you, to you, Moses. And yet Moses, yet Moses says, I want it all. I want to know everything about you, God. I want to know who you really are. I want more. I want more. I'm willing to take the risk, whatever it takes. I just want to see your glory, God. And I don't know. I mean, I'll just state the obvious. This is the lesson that Moses' life gives to us. His hunger for God never stopped. His, the experiences he had with God, not enough. The grace he had was amazing, but it did not completely satisfy him. He kept saying, show me, show me there's something else, God. There's something beyond the Red Sea and the manna and the tent and the cloud. God, my heart longs for you. Now, if you're new to the faith, this message is probably freaking you out. I mean, you might be one of those guys that's like, no, I just came to church to check things out today. I have a little trouble with my marriage. I need some help with some, my finances. I do not want the flesh thing that causes my skeleton to, I, I don't even, that's not even anything in my mind. But I'll just tell you, it's trick. It's a trick. If you hang out with God, not instead of religion. If you hang out with God, you're going to get sucked into deep longings and thirsts. And you'll be satisfied at the same time. It's a crazy thing. You're thirsty and satisfied at the same time. But you'll end up with stories and you'll end up with special tents and you'll end up with miracle provision and you'll have all these kind of, you'll just fall in love. You'll fall in love and go deeper and deeper and deeper and, and deeper. But I need to warn you, religion will never ever carry this danger of consuming your flesh. Only a relationship with God. And if I could just decree over all our campuses and all, all of the house called Trinity right now, our greatest responsibility and our greatest privilege, I mean now, what are we doing right now? We are saying what Moses said. We are saying, God, show us your glory. Let your glory come into the earth. Come into the episodes of our life. We need your glory. We want your glory, God. And that's the best explanation I have to help understand what's happening in the Saturday night awakening services and what's happening on Monday night with Trinity Young Adults and Tuesday night intercession and Wednesday night young the students. It just every time, every time they're gathering, it's just, a, it's just a new dimension of God on display. And I'll just close this message with a couple of applications, two or three, five applications. Because I, I have to be honest with you, I haven't always wanted the glory of God in my walk with God. I, 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 I wanted ministry success. I wanted, I wanted a healthy family. I wanted, I wanted a lot of things, but I haven't really wanted the glory of God like I have in the recent season of my life. And can I just say that the glory of God can be in those things. It can be in your family. It can be in your business. But those are not designed to thrive without the glory. They're not supposed to stand alone. So, so here are the action items. Here are the action items for us. Ready? Number one, if you would like to pray the prayer that Moses prayed, number one, begin with grace. Begin with grace. Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God who is rich in his mercy because of his great love, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Moses knew he didn't deserve a friendship with God. He knew that God's kindness was more, than, but he lived in this confidence. God likes me. He wants me. He, he's going to be with me. 
And, and I just want to say it again, it's not grace unless it astonishes you, unless it's amazing to you. It's not grace. It can be doctrine or religion, but grace is going to open your heart up to a desire for the things of God. Grace is amazing because it comes while we're dead in our trespasses. It's amazing because it comes to the fugitives. It's amazing because it never stops. It's amazing because it's greater than anything you'll ever face in your wilderness. Begin with grace. Number two, choose an identity that keeps you close to God. Clarify your identity. Decide who you're going to be. Hebrews 11, 24. It's talking about Moses. Hebrews 11, 24, talking about Moses, says, By faith, Moses, when he became of age. I didn't say this in the first service, but I'm going to say it here. Parents, until your children come of age, make decisions for them. They, kids... Don't get to choose whether they come to church or not. Anyway. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be. He made a choice. He could have lived as a grandson of the most important man in the whole world, Pharaoh. He could have lived in the palace with all the wealth, with all the wine, with all the food, with all the girls. He could have had all the things that the world had to offer, but he refused that identity in order to have an identity with the people who were going to go after God. I just wonder, what are we refusing in order to go to the next place with God? What are we refusing? Because every human being, every human being is going to make this choice. Every human being has to say, is my significance because I belong to the right peer group or the right economic status? Am I accepted by what I wear or what I drive? Or am I going to make a, ch am I going to refuse those things in order to belong to the people who have been assigned to steward the glory and the grace that God has on, on the earth? I mean, I, I, I made this choice more than once, but especially in high school, you know, I'd had an encounter with God at four years old. I, I, I knew God was real, but when I came to high school, it was like, I don't really want to be a radical Christian. We had so many weird people in our church in Columbus, Georgia, just so crazy, on fire, weird people. I was like, I don't want to be like that. I just want to be saved. I, I just want to go to heaven. I just, but it doesn't work like that. God's jealous passion for you is never going to leave you in the palace filled with idols. He's never. He's going to stay after you. So begin with grace. Clarify your identity. Number three, choose. You're not going to like this one. Choose to suffer for a while. There it is in Hebrews 11, verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He looked to the reward. He looked to the reward. Paul says the same thing in Romans 8, 18. He says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I don't know how many of you were here Monday night, but it was just, just an amazing pregnant presence of God. And um, I was over against the wall. I'd come straight from the airport just to be in the Monday night service. And, and um, oh, it was such a sweet presence of the Lord. And Gabe and I were standing over there talking. And, and, and um, I went to tell Gabe something, and he was gone. I don't know where he went. He was like, and then I found him. He was up on the stage. And he went over to, the, I don't know which one, but one of the musicians. And, he, and I figured this out later. He says, I want you guys to play something that sounds like rain. Because the theme at the time of the Holy Spirit was let the rain, let the rain come. And so these instrumentalists begin to just prophesy on their instruments. They begin to play. It was the most amazing, like 10 or 15 minutes. I don't know. It was, it was just like breathtaking presence of God. And it reminded me that when I was in junior high, some of my buddies decided that they wanted to start a band. And I wanted to be in the band. So in order to be in the band, I told them that I 
played the drums. I lied. I wanted so much to be in the band that I just said, I play the drums. Because anybody can play drums, right? I mean, that's, and I just figured, I figured I could figure it out, you know. I mean, for years, my, I told my kids that I played drums for the band Chicago. I'll just tell you, if you live a lot, it's going to catch up with you sooner or later. But. Now listen, I know what it is to get anointed, but I still can't play the drums. And the reason I can't play the drums is because those guys suffered while I was playing stickball. I don't know if you understand the illustration or not, but while I was running around with my friends, they were practicing their guitar. And, and so now they carry a unique display of glory while I carry jealousy. I don't know if I'm making sense, but Moses hungered for a participation with God that he did not have, even though he had a lot. He's like, God, I've tasted enough to know that what else ever is out there, I'm willing to suffer for it. I'm willing to focus my life. I'm willing to discipline. I'm not talking, I'm not talking about weird suffering. I'm not talk, talking about religious suffering. I'm not talking about observing holidays or wearing weird clothes or having a freaky haircut, anything like that. I'm just, I'm just trying to remind the body of Christ that there's someone out there. There's something worth focusing on, giving your life to, disciplining yourself for. What did, well, it says it right there. It says he did it because there were treasures beyond the riches of Egypt. He says, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there. I, I don't know if I'll try it at a different angle. You know, when I married Beck, I suffered. Well, let me clarify. <laughs> when I married Beck, I lost control of my schedule. Her favorite text is WYD, what you doing? I, I, whatever I'm doing, I have to report it now. I used to didn't have to do that. <laughs> I used to be my own man. I lost a lot when I married back. I mean, all those, there weren't that many girlfriends. I just, I just, my life got narrower. And this is not sarcastic. It's, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. No, it's so worth it. And if what I had to do in order to have the glory of this marriage, how much more is the glory of this relationship worth whatever I need to do to get my life in alignment? So begin with grace, clarify your identity. Enter the disciplines or focus on the disciplines. Be willing to suffer a little bit. Number four, engage experiences that testify to the reality of God. He just had a lot of testimonies. And again, I love being old. I liked being young, but I like being old because Moses could tell the stories. He said, man, we crossed the Red Sea. We went to the mountain. We stood against the rebels. We worshiped. We, we, all of the activities of his life, he just invited God. He invited God. He invited God into every activity of his life, and God engaged the story. Every time God would show up, and I don't know if there's anybody in the 11 o'clock service old enough to have any stories or testimonies. I just wish I could start telling you about the youth camp experience where the presence of God turned my heart and called me into the full-time ministry. I wish I could tell you about the time that J.B. Oates and I were praying for people in the altar. And we just touched one another, and the, it was like we were slingshotted across the room because of the presence of the Lord. I wish I could tell you about the time we were 
were in the old sanctuary worshiping God and we thought there was a flood. We could literally feel water on our ankles and then our, our knees, the presence of the Lord moving through like a river. I wish I could tell you about the time. I got the phone call and they said, well, do you want to come to Cedar Hill, Texas and be the pastor of Trinity Church? And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, get ready, you're moving to see. I just wish I could tell you some testimonies about God being with us. But when you tell the testimonies, the hunger grows. And then finally, number five, so begin with grace. Clarify your identity. Suffer for the glory to come. Test, have your testimonies, get, share them, tell them. And then number five, use your imagination. Because what Moses did that is so amazing to me is he imagined that God's glory literally could come into the earth. I mean, this might be the main thing. He believed that the former slaves could be a nation of priests and kings and worshipers through which all the nations of the earth could be blessed. That's the covenant that God had made with Abraham. And Moses just believed it. Moses wanted his friend, the Lord, to flourish in the earth. He had an instinct for it. You know, Habakkuk 2.14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Like we think the glory of the Lord is in the heavens. But no, Habakkuk said, There's going to be a day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. In fact, it was Jesus' final prayer. It was his final prayer. In John chapter 17, he said, Father, I've finished. I've finished my job. I, I've done what you've asked me to do. He said, I manifested your glory in the earth. I showed the world what you were like. And then this is his final prayer. He says, now, Father, would you set them apart? Would you show them, talking about his friends, us? He says, would you let the glory that I had, the glory that we shared together, would you let it come to them? Would you let them be the stewards of our glory in the earth? That's his final prayer. And I know it's easy for imaginations right now, so many imaginations like, oh, I imagine the world falling apart. I imagine a new civil war in America. I imagine, listen, it's the job of the people of God to imagine the earth filled with his glory. So we're gonna worship the Lord for a few more minutes. And while we're worshiping the Lord, we're going to distribute the elements for communion. We haven't had communion in quite a while, so I'm eager to gather with you around the, the shed blood of Jesus and the broken body of Christ. I'll just ask that you worship and receive the elements at the same time and hold the elements until we've all been served. And then we'll come back and have a closing prayer and take the elements together.